name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today's Gospel reading, we encounter two blind men crying out to the Lord for healing. As with many events in the Gospel, there's both the history of this event, revealing the Lord's compassion for two people who were greatly afflicted. There's also a deeper spiritual meaning to these events as well. I'd like us to focus our attention on a few details in particular today. These blind men cry out to Jesus as the awaited Messiah of God, the Son of David, who was prophesied to come and deliver the people of Israel and establish a kingdom like the great King David of old. But what no one at that time suspected was that God had planned something even greater for the human race. That the Messiah would not just be the son of David, a man from the royal line, but the son of God himself. That the kingdom he would establish would not be an earthly kingdom, but an eternal kingdom, not of this world, the kingdom of heaven. And so these two blind men cry out to Jesus for mercy the two symbolically representing the Jews and the Gentiles. In other words, the whole human race crying out, not for healing per se, but for mercy, that is, for his compassion, his visitation. It's a striking confession of faith, because they don't just demand an outcome, like, give me my sight, heal my eyes, but they commend themselves entirely into his hands, trusting that Jesus knows what they have need of. And then, in the next verse, something easy to overlook, but essential. We hear that they enter into the house. And it's only within the house that their healing takes place. This house, you see, symbolizes the church. Confession is made. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord. And their eyes are opened. Their eyes are opened. They come to see Jesus, not just as the Son of David, but as the Son of God. They come to see God, to know God in the house that is in the church. And this is precisely what we experience right here in the house of God up to the present day. We're brought to the church, sometimes by the faith of others, by our parents or godparents. For example, think of the paralytic being brought to Jesus last week through the faith of his friends. And sometimes we're drawn to him with an incomplete understanding like these blind men, are drawn to him for reasons we don't fully understand or can't explain, but nonetheless with the faith that Jesus is the answer. And it's in the house of God that all is laid bare. The fullness of God's revelation is laid bare, revealed to us in the inspired hymns and prayers, and especially in the divine presence of Christ in our midst during the prayers and in the Holy Sacrament. Our blindness as to what matters in life. What is the meaning of life? What should I value? What should I live for? Is healed. Our blindness is healed. We receive vision, the vision of God. We come to understand that Jesus Christ is all in all. That he is the Son of God, one of the Holy Trinity, worshipped with his Heavenly Father and his Holy Spirit. And we're inspired to sing and confess as we will at the end of liturgy. We have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have found the true faith, worshiping the undivided Trinity who has saved us. The blind men receive their sight, and then surprisingly, Jesus admonishes them to keep silent. See that no one knows it, he says. But not for them, but not for them to hide their light under a bushel, so to speak, but to show that Jesus doesn't seek human glory or the praise of men. It's another witness to the humility of Jesus, the humility of God who teaches us that when we do good, we shouldn't let our right hand know what our left is doing. But these formerly blind men have been touched by the grace of God, and they simply cannot remain silent. And this too, according to St. John Chrysostom, is right and pleasing to God. When they had departed, they spread the news about Jesus in all that country. And consequently, more who were ill and in need of healing are brought to Jesus through their testimony. Reflecting on this reading, reminded of the 26th Psalm. The Lord is my life and my Savior. Whom then shall I fear? When the grace of God touches us, removes our blindness, there's nothing to fear in this world. 
And what's more, we desire nothing more than to be with God and to abide in the house of God. As the psalm continues, One thing have I asked of the Lord, this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I felt this very strongly on my own life, and I hope that you have too. I first came to the Orthodox Church some 15 years ago, a college student. I remember experiencing so profoundly the Divine Liturgy that I just had to keep coming back. Something beyond my rational understanding was transpiring there. It was a worship, the worship of God in a way more real than I could have ever imagined. Heaven and earth come together, the kingdom of God come in power. Not that the Divine Liturgy is something dramatic or emotional in a worldly sense, but it was very clear to me then, as it still is, that all of the people gathered together in worship, all of us here, become something so much more than the sum of individuals. And I remember looking around one day and thinking, was, what was it here? Was it a church maybe a little more than half, half full at the time? I remember thinking, how is it that we're not packed wall to wall? How is it that everyone out there is not rushing to be here, breaking down the doors? Because what in the world could possibly be more real, more meaningful, more essential than this? And I still believe this in the core of my being. And I struggle, as many of you I'm sure have as well, with how to convey that experience, how to share it. Perhaps, perhaps we overthink it though. It's just a thought. The blind men came into the house and received their sight, their healing from Jesus. They came to know him as Lord and as God. And for joy, they simply could not help but share with others that Jesus is the answer to every question. He's all we need. Jesus is all in all. The modern world is full of problems, full of complications, complexes. We're constantly running from one place to the next, one cure to the next, one doctor to the next, one diet, one election, one job to the next, whatever it may be. Well, that's all fine and good in its own place. But what if I place God first? What if I were to say no to whatever else may be demanding the first place of my time, my heart, my energy, and say, no, not now. Liturgy comes first. My time with God and the people of God comes first. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Placing first the kingdom of God, then we'll, come to, then we'll have the strength in Christ to meet the challenges that come throughout the week, the wisdom to discern His will, and the grace to be vessels of His love. We partake here of the bread of heaven, the flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. His life becomes our life, His strength our strength, His patience our patience, His joys and sorrows our joys and sorrows. I can do all things, says St. Paul, through Christ who strengthens me. So brothers and sisters, this week I call us to nothing more than to reflect on how great and wonderful is our gathering here in the house of God, to thank Him for it, and to really appreciate it and value it. In the next few weeks as we celebrate the Feast of Transfiguration and our mission, we'll have more opportunities to be in church together and to allow our lives to be transfigured by the grace and light of God. Glory to God. One thing have I asked of the Lord, this will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and that I may behold the delight of the Lord. To whom be all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Let us all say with all our soul, with all our mind, let us say.